Book One, Chapter Eighteen of My Antonia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephanie Dupal de Martin. My Antonia by Willa Cather. Book One, The Shimerdas, Chapter Eighteen. After I began to go to the country school, I saw less of the Bohemians. We were sixteen pupils at the sod schoolhouse, and we all came on horseback and brought our dinner. My schoolmates were none of them very interesting, but I somehow felt that by making comrades of them I was getting even with Antonia for her indifference. Since the father's death, Ambrosch was more than ever the head of the house, and he seemed to direct the feelings as well as the fortunes of his womenfolk. Antonia often quoted his opinions to me, and she let me see that she admired him while she thought of me only as a little boy. Before the spring was over, there was a distinct coldness between us and the Shimerdas. It came about in this way. One Sunday I rode over there with Jake to get a horse collar which Ambrosch had borrowed from him and not returned. It was a beautiful blue morning. The buffalo peas were blooming in pink and purple masses along the roadside, and the larks perched on last year's dried sunflower stalks were singing straight at the sun, their heads thrown back and their yellow breasts a-quiver. The wind blew about us in warm, sweet gusts. We rode slowly, with a pleasant sense of Sunday indolence. We found the Shimerdas working just as if it were a weekday. Merrick was cleaning up the stable, and Antonia and her mother were making garden, off across the pond in the drawhead. Ambrosch was up on the windmill tower, oiling the wheel. He came down not very cordially, when Jake asked for the collar, he grunted and scratched his head. The collar belonged to Grandfather, of course, and Jake, feeling responsible for it, flared up. "'Now don't you say you haven't got an Ambrosh, because I know you have, and if you ain't a-going to look for it, I will.' Ambrosh shrugged his shoulders and sauntered down the hill toward the stable. I could see that it was one of his mean days. Presently he returned, carrying a collar that had been badly used— trampled in the dirt and gnawed by rats until the hair was sticking out of it. "'This what you want?' he asked surlily. Jake jumped off his horse. I saw a wave of red come up under the rough stubble on his face. "'That ain't the piece of harness I loaned you, Ambrosh. Or if it is, you've used it shameful. I ain't a-going to carry such a looking thing back to Mr. Burden.' Ambrosh dropped the collar on the ground. "'All right,' he said coolly, took up his oil can and began to climb the mill. Jake caught him by the belt of his trousers and yanked him back. Ambrosch's feet had scarcely touched the ground when he lunged out with a vicious kick at Jake's stomach. Fortunately, Jake was in such a position that he could dodge it. This was not the sort of thing country boys did when they played at fisticuffs, and Jake was furious. He landed Ambrosch a blow on the head. It sounded like the crack of an axe on a cow pumpkin. Ambrosch dropped over, stunned. We heard squeals, and looking up, saw Antonia and her mother coming on the run. They did not take the path around the pond, but plunged through the muddy water without even lifting their skirts. They came on, screaming and clawing the air. By this time Ambrosch had come to his senses, and was sputtering his nosebleed. Jake sprang into his saddle. "'Let's get out of this, Jim,' he called. Mrs. Shimerda threw her hands over her head and clutched, as if she were going to pull down lightning. "'Law! Law!' she shrieked after us. "'Law for knock my Ambrosch down!' "'I never like you no more!' "'Jake and Jim Burden,' Antonia panted. "'No friends, any more!' "'Jake stopped and turned his horse for a second. "'Well, you're a damned ungrateful lot, the whole pack of you,' he shouted back. "'I guess the Burdens can get along without you. "'You've been a sight of trouble to them anyhow.' We rode away, feeling so outraged that the fine morning was spoiled for us. I hadn't a word to say, and poor Jake was white as paper and trembling all over. It made him sick to get so angry. They ain't the same, Jimmy, he kept saying in a hurt tone. These foreigners ain't the same. You can't trust em to be fair. It's dirty to kick a feller. You heard how the women turn on you, and after all we went through on accent of em last winter, they ain't to be trusted. I don't want to see you get too thick with any of em. I'll never be friends with them again, Jake, I declared hotly. I believe they're all like Kradziak and Ambrosch underneath. Grandfather heard our story with a twinkle in his eye. 
he advised Jake to write to town tomorrow, go to a justice of the peace, tell him he had knocked young Shimerda down and pay his fine. Then if Mrs. Shimerda was inclined to make trouble, her son was still under age, she would be forestalled. Jake said he might as well take the wagon and haul to market the pig he had been fattening. On Monday, about an hour after Jake had started, we saw Mrs. Shimerda and her Ambrosh proudly driving by, looking neither to the right nor left. As they rattled out of sight down the Black Hawk Road, Grandfather chuckled, saying he had rather expected she would follow the matter up. Jake paid his fine with a ten-dollar bill Grandfather had given him for that purpose. But when the Shimerdas found that Jake sold his pig in town that day, Ambrosh worked it out in his shrewd head that Jake had to sell his pig to pay his fine. This theory afforded the Shimerdas great satisfaction, apparently. For weeks afterward, whenever Jake and I met Antonia on her way to the post office, or going along the road with her work team, she would clap her hands and call to us in a spiteful, crowing voice, "'Jakey, Jakey, sell the pig and pay the slap!' Otto pretended not to be surprised at Antonia's behavior. He only lifted his brows and said, "'You can't tell me anything new about a check. I'm an Austrian.' Grandfather was never a party to what Jake called her feud with the Shimerdas. Ambrosch and Antonia always greeted him respectfully, and he asked them about their affairs and gave them advice as usual. He thought the future looked hopeful for them. Ambrosch was a far-seeing fellow. He soon realized that his oxen were too heavy for any work except breaking sod, and he succeeded in selling them to a newly arrived German. With the money he bought another team of horses, which Grandfather selected for him. Merrick was strong, and Ambrosch worked him hard. But he could never teach him to cultivate corn, I remember. The one idea that had ever got through poor Merrick's thick head was that all exertion was meritorious. He always bore down on the handles of the cultivator and drove the blades so deep into the earth that the horses were soon exhausted. In June, Ambrosch went to work at Mr. Bushy's for a week and took Merrick with him at full wages. Mrs. Shimerda then drove the second cultivator. She and Antonia worked in the fields all day and did the chores at night. While the two women were running the place alone, one of the new horses got colic and gave them a terrible fright. Antonia had gone down to the barn one night to see that all was well before she went to bed, and she noticed that one of the roans was swollen about the middle and stood with its head hanging. She mounted another horse without waiting to saddle him, and hammered on her door just as we were going to bed. Grandfather answered her knock. He did not send one of his men, but rode back with her himself, taking a syringe and an old piece of carpet he kept for hot applications when her horses were sick. He found Mrs. Shimerda sitting by the horse with her lantern, groaning and wringing her hands. It took but a few moments to release the gases pent up in the poor beast, and the two women heard the rush of wind and saw the roan visibly diminish in girth. "'If I lose that horse, Mr. Burden,' Antonia exclaimed, "'I never stay here till Ambrosch come home. I go drown myself in the pond before morning.' When Ambrosch came back from Mr. Bushy's, we learned that he had given Merrick's wages to the priest at Black Hawk for masses for their father's soul. Grandmother thought Antonia needed shoes more than Mr. Shimerda needed prayers, but Grandfather said tolerantly, If he can spare six dollars, pinched as he is, it shows he believes what he professes. It was Grandfather who brought about a reconciliation with the Shimerdas. One morning he told us that the small grain was coming on so well he thought he would begin to cut his wheat on the 1st of July. He would need more men, and if it were agreeable to every one, he would engage Ambrosch for the reaping and thrashing, as the Shimerdas had no small grain of their own. "'I think, Emmeline,' he concluded, "'I will ask Antonia to come over and help you in the kitchen. She will be glad to earn something, and it will be a good time to end misunderstandings.' I may as well ride over this morning and make arrangements. Do you want to go with me, Jim? His tone told me that he had already decided for me. After breakfast, we set off together. When Mrs. Shimerda saw us coming, she ran from her door down into the draw behind the stable, as if she did not want to meet us. Grandfather smiled to himself while he tied his horse, and we followed her. Behind the barn we came upon a funny sight. The cow had evidently been grazing somewhere in the draw. Mrs. Shimerda had run to the animal, pulled up the lariat pin, and when we came upon her she was trying to hide the cow in an old cave in the bank. 
As the hole was narrow and dark, the cow held back, and the old woman was slapping and pushing at her hind quarters, trying to spank her into the draw side. Grandfather ignored her singular occupation and greeted her politely. Good morning, Mrs. Shimerda. Can you tell me where I will find Ambrosch? Which field? He with the sod cord. She pointed toward the north, still standing in front of the cow as if she hoped to conceal it. His sod corn will be good for fodder this winter, said Grandfather encouragingly. And where is Antonia? She go with him. Mrs. Shimerda kept wiggling her bare feet about nervously in the dust. Very well, I will ride up there. I want them to come over and help me cut my oats and wheat next month. I will pay them wages. Good morning. By the way, Mrs. Shimerda, he said as he turned up the path, I think we may as well call it square about the cow. She started and clutched the rope tighter. Seeing that she did not understand, Grandfather turned back. You need not pay me anything more. No more money. The cow is yours. Pay no more. Keep cow, she asked in a bewildered tone, her narrow eyes snapping at us in the sunlight. Exactly. Pay no more. Keep cow, he nodded. Mrs. Shimerda dropped the rope, ran after us, and crouching down beside Grandfather, she took his hand and kissed it. I doubt if he had ever been so much embarrassed before. I was a little startled, too. Somehow that seemed to bring the old world very close. We rode away laughing, and Grandfather said, I expect she thought we had come to take the cow away for certain, Jim. I wonder if she wouldn't have scratched a little if we'd laid hold of that lariat rope. Our neighbors seemed glad to make peace with us. The next Sunday Mrs. Shimerda came over and brought Jake a pair of socks she had knitted. She presented them with an air of great magnanimity, saying, Now you not come any more for knock my ambrosh down. Jake laughed sheepishly. I don't want to have no trouble with ambrosh. If he let me alone, I'll let him alone. If he slap you, we ain't got no pig for pay the fine she said insinuatingly. If he slap you, we ain't got no pig for pay the fine, she said insinuatingly. Jake was not at all disconcerted. Have the last word, ma'am, he said cheerfully. It's a lady's privilege. End of chapter 18 Recording by Stephanie Dupal de Martin Book One, Chapter Nineteen of My Antonia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephanie Dupal de Martin. My Antonia by Willa Cather. Book One, The Shimerdas, Chapter Nineteen. July came on with that breathless, brilliant heat which makes the plains of Kansas and Nebraska the best corn country in the world. It seemed as if we could hear the corn growing in the night. Under the stars one caught a faint crackling in the dewy, heavy-odored cornfields where the feathered stalks stood so juicy and green. If all the great plain from the Missouri to the Rocky Mountains had been under glass, and the heat regulated by a thermometer, it could not have been better for the yellow tassels that were ripening and fertilizing each other day by day. The cornfields were far apart in those times, with miles of wild grazing land between. It took a clear meditative eye like my grandfather's to foresee that they would enlarge and multiply until they would be, not the Shimerda's cornfields or Mr. Bushy's, but the world's cornfields, that their yield would be one of the great economic facts like the wheat crop of Russia, which underlie all the activities of men, in peace or war. The burning sun of those few weeks, with occasional rains at night, secured the corn. After the milky ears were once formed, we had little to fear from dry weather. The men were working so hard in the wheat fields that they did not notice the heat, though I was kept busy carrying water for them, and Grandmother and Antonia had so much to do in the kitchen that they could not have told whether one day was hotter than another. Each morning, while the dew was still on the grass, Antonia went with me up to the garden to get early vegetables for dinner. Grandmother made her wear a sunbonnet, but as soon as we reached the garden she threw it on the grass and let her hair fly in the breeze. 
I remember how, as we bent over the pea vines, beads of perspiration used to gather on her upper lip, like a little mustache. Oh, better I like to work out of doors than in a house, she used to sing joyfully. I not care that your grandmother say it makes me like a man. I like to be like a man. She would toss her head and ask me to feel the muscles swell in her brown arm. We were glad to have her in the house. She was so gay and responsive that one did not mind her heavy running step or her clattery way with pans. Grandmother was in high spirits during the weeks that Antonia worked for us. All the nights were close and hot during that harvest season. The harvesters slept in the hayloft because it was cooler there than in the house. I used to lie in my bed by the open window, watching the heat lightning play softly along the horizon, or looking up at the gaunt frame of the windmill against the blue night sky. One night there was a beautiful electric storm, though not enough rain fell to damage the cut grain. The men went down to the barn immediately after supper, and when the dishes were washed, Antonia and I climbed up on the slanting roof of the chicken house to watch the clouds. The thunder was loud and metallic, like the rattle of sheet iron, and the lightning broke in great zigzags across the heavens, making everything stand out and come close to us for a moment. Half the sky was checkered with black thunderheads, but all the west was luminous and clear. In the lightning flashes it looked like deep blue water, with a sheen of moonlight on it, and the mottled part of the sky was like marble pavement, like the quay of some splendid seacoast city doomed to destruction. Great warm splashes of rain fell on her upturned faces. One black cloud, no bigger than a little boat, drifted out into the clear space unattended and kept moving westward. All about us we could hear the felty beat of the raindrops on the soft dust of the farmyard. Grandmother came to the door and said it was late, and we would get wet out there. "'In a minute we come,' Antonia called back to her. "'I like your grandmother and all things here,' she sighed. "'I wish my papa lived to see the summer. I wish no winter ever come again. "'It will be summer a long while yet,' I reassured her. "'Why aren't you always nice like this, Tony? "'How nice. Why, just like this, like yourself.' Why do you all the time try to be like Ambrosch? She put her arms under her head and lay back, looking up at the sky. If I live here like you, that is different. Things will be easy for you, but they will be hard for us. End of chapter 19 Recording by Stephanie Dupal de Martin Book Two, Chapter One of My Antonia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katie Gibbony, Arkansas, November 2007. My Antonia by Willa Cather. Book Two, The Hired Girls, Chapter One. I had been living with my grandfather for nearly three years when he decided to move to Black Hawk. He and grandmother were getting old for the heavy work of a farm, and as I was now thirteen, they thought I ought to be going to school. Accordingly, our homestead was rented to that good woman, the widow Stevens, and her bachelor brother, and we bought Preacher White's house at the north end of Black Hawk. This was the first townhouse one passed driving in from the farm a landmark which told country people their long ride was over. We were to move to Black Hawk in March, and as soon as Grandfather had fixed the date, he let Jake and Otto know of his intention. Otto said he would not be likely to find another place that suited him so well, that he was tired of farming and thought he would go back to what he called the Wild West. Jake Marpole, lured by Otto's stories of adventure, decided to go with him. We did our best to dissuade Jake. He was so handicapped by illiteracy and by his trusting disposition that he would be an easy prey to sharpers. Grandmother begged him to stay among kindly Christian people, where he was known, but there was no reasoning with him. He wanted to be a prospector. He thought a silver mine was waiting for him in Colorado. 
Jake and Otto served us to the last. They moved us into town, put down the carpets in our new house, made shelves and cupboards for grandmother's kitchen, and seemed loath to leave us. But at last they went, without warning. Those two fellows had been faithful to us through sun and storm, had given us things that cannot be bought in any market in the world. With me they had been like older brothers, had restrained their speech and manners out of care for me, and given me so much good comradeship. Now they got on the westbound train one morning, in their Sunday clothes, with their oilcloth valises, and I never saw them again. Months afterward we got a card from Otto, saying that Jake had been down with mountain fever, but now they were both working in the Yankee girl mine, and were doing well. I wrote to them at that address, but my letter was returned to me, unclaimed. After that we never heard from them. Black Hawk, the new world in which we had come to live, was a clean, well-planted little prairie town, with white fences and good green yards about the dwellings, wide, dusty streets, and shapely little trees growing along the wooden sidewalks. In the center of the town there were two rows of new brick store buildings, a brick schoolhouse, the courthouse, and four white churches. Our own house looked down over the town, and from our upstairs windows we could see the winding line of the river bluffs two miles south of us. That river was to be my compensation for the lost freedom of the farming country. We came to Black Hawk in March, and by the end of April we felt like town people. Grandfather was a deacon in the New Baptist Church, Grandmother was busy with church suppers and missionary societies, and I was quite another boy, or thought I was. Suddenly put down among boys of my own age, I found I had a great deal to learn. Before the spring term of school was over I could fight, play keeps, tease the little girls, and use forbidden words as well as any boy in my class. I was restrained from utter savagery only by the fact that Mrs. Harling, our nearest neighbor, kept an eye on me, and if my behavior went beyond certain bounds I was not permitted to come into her yard or to play with her jolly children. We saw more of our country neighbors now than when we'd lived on the farm. Our house was a convenient stopping place for them. We had a big barn where the farmers could put up their teams, and their women folk more often accompanied them now that they could stay with us for dinner and rest and set their bonnets right before they went shopping. The more our house was like a country hotel, the better I liked it. I was glad, when I came home from school at noon, to see a farm wagon standing in the back yard, and I was always ready to run downtown to get a beefsteak or baker's bread for unexpected company. All through that first spring and summer I kept hoping that Ambrose would bring Antonia and Yulka to see our new house. I wanted to show them our red plush furniture and the trumpet-blowing cherubs the German paper hanger had put on our parlor ceiling. When Ambrose came to town, however, he came alone, and though he put his horses in our barn, he would never stay for dinner or tell us anything about his mother and sisters. If we ran out and questioned him as he was slipping through the yard, he would merely work his shoulders about in his coat and say, "'They all right, I guess.' Mrs. Stevens, who now lived on our farm, grew as fond of Antonia as we had been, and always brought us news of her. All through the wheat season, she told us, Ambrose hired his sister out like a man, and she went from farm to farm, binding sheaves or working with the thrashers. The farmers liked her and were kind to her, said they would rather have her for a hand than Ambrose. When fall came she was to husk corn for the neighbors until Christmas, as she had done the year before but Grandmother saved her from this by getting her a place to work with our neighbors, the Harlings. End of chapter 1 Book 2, Chapter 2 of My Antonia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katie Gibbony, Arkansas, November 2007. My Antonia by Willa Cather, Book Two, The Hired Girls, Chapter Two. Grandmother often said that if she had to live in town, she thanked God she lived next the Harlings. 
They had been farming people like ourselves, and their place was like a little farm, with a big barn and a garden, and an orchard and grazing lots, even a windmill. The Harlings were Norwegians, and Mrs. Harling had lived in Christiana until she was ten years old. Her husband was born in Minnesota. He was a grain merchant and cattle buyer, and was generally considered the most enterprising businessman in our county. He controlled a line of grain elevators in the little towns along the railroad to the west of us, and was away from home a great deal. In his absence, his wife was the head of the household. Mrs. Harling was short and square and sturdy-looking, like her house. Every inch of her was charged with an energy that made itself felt the moment she entered a room. Her face was rosy and solid, with bright twinkling eyes and a stubborn little chin. She was quick to anger, quick to laughter, and jolly from the depths of her soul. How well I remember her laugh! It had in it the same sudden recognition that flashed into her eyes, was a burst of humor, short and intelligent. Her rapid footsteps shook her own floors, and she routed lassitude and indifference wherever she came. She could not be negative or perfunctory about anything. Her enthusiasm and her violent likes and dislikes asserted themselves into all the everyday occupations of life. Wash day was interesting, never dreary, at the Harlings. Preserving time was a prolonged festival, and house-cleaning was like a revolution. When Mrs. Harling made garden that spring, we could feel the stir of her undertaking through the willow hedge that separated our place from hers. Three of the Harling children were near me in age. Charlie, the only son, they had lost an older boy, was sixteen. Julia, who was known as the musical one, was fourteen when I was, and Sally, the tomboy with short hair, was a year younger. She was nearly as strong as I, and uncannily clever at all boys' sports. Sally was a wild thing, with sunburned yellow hair, bobbed about her ears, and a brown skin, for she never wore a hat. She raced all over town on one roller skate, often cheated at keeps, but was such a quick shot one couldn't catch her at it. The grown-up daughter, Frances, was a very important person in our world. She was her father's chief clerk, and virtually managed his Black Hawk office during his frequent absences. Because of her unusual business ability, he was stern and exacting with her. He paid her a good salary, but she had few holidays and never got away from her responsibilities. Even on Sundays she went to the office to open the mail and read the markets. With Charlie, who was not interested in business, but was already preparing for Annapolis, Mr. Harling was very indulgent, bought him guns and tools and electric batteries, and never asked what he did with them. Frances was dark, like her father, and quite as tall. In winter she wore a sealskin coat and cap, and she and Mr. Harling used to walk home together in the evening, talking about grain cars and cattle, like two men. Sometimes she came over to see Grandfather after supper, and her visits flattered him. More than once they put their wits together to rescue some unfortunate farmer from the clutches of Wick Cutter, the Black Hawk moneylender. Grandfather said Francis Harling was as good a judge of credits as any banker in the county. The two or three men who had tried to take advantage of her in a deal acquired celebrity by their defeat. She knew every farmer for miles about, how much land he had under cultivation, how many cattle he was feeding, what his liabilities were. Her interest in these people was more than a business interest. She carried them all in her mind as if they were characters in a book or a play. When Frances drove out into the country on business, she would go miles out of her way to call on some of the old people, or to see the women who seldom got to town. She was quick at understanding the grandmothers, who spoke no English, and the most reticent and distrustful of them would tell her their story, without realizing they were doing so. She went to country funerals and weddings in all weathers. A farmer's daughter who was to be married could count on a wedding present from Frances Harling. In August the Harling's Danish cook had to leave them. Grandmother entreated them to try Antonia. She cornered Ambrose the next time he came to town, and pointed out to him that any connection with Christian Harling would strengthen his credit and be of advantage to him. One Sunday Mrs. Harling took the long ride out to the Shimerdas with Francis. She said she wanted to see what the girl came from, and to have a clear understanding with her mother. 
I was in our yard when they came driving home, just before sunset. They laughed and waved to me as they passed, and I could see they were in great good humor. After supper, when Grandfather set off to church, Grandmother and I took my shortcut through the willow hedge and went over to hear about the visit to the Shimerdas. We found Mrs. Harling with Charlie and Sally on the front porch, resting after her hard drive. Julia was in the hammock. She was fond of repose. And Frances was at the piano, playing without a light and talking to her mother through the open window. Mrs. Harling laughed when she saw us coming. I expect you left your dishes on the table tonight, Mrs. Burden, she called. Frances shut the piano and came out to join us. They had liked Antonia from their first glimpse of her, felt they knew exactly what kind of girl she was. As for Mrs. Shimerda, they found her very amusing. Mrs. Harling chuckled whenever she spoke of her. I expect I am more at home with that sort of bird than you are, Mrs. Burden. They're a pair, Ambrose and that old woman. They had had a long argument with Ambrose about Antonia's allowances for clothes and pocket money. It was his plan that every cent of his sister's wages should be paid over to him each month, and he would provide her with such clothing as he thought necessary. When Mrs. Harling told him firmly that she would keep fifty dollars a year for Antonia's own use, he declared they wanted to take his sister to town and dress her up and make a fool of her. Mrs. Harling gave us a lively account of Ambrose's behavior throughout the interview, how he kept jumping up and putting on his cap as if he were through with the whole business, and how his mother tweaked his coat tail and prompted him in bohemian. Mrs. Harling finally agreed to pay three dollars a week for Antonia's services, good wages in those days, and to keep her in shoes. There had been hot dispute about the shoes, Mrs. Shimerda finally saying persuasively that she would send Mrs. Harling three fat geese every year to make even. Ambrose was to bring his sister to town next Saturday. She'll be awkward and rough at first, like enough, Grandmother said anxiously, but unless she's been spoiled by the hard life she's led, she has it in her to be a real helpful girl. Mrs. Harling laughed her quick, decided laugh. Oh, I'm not worrying, Mrs. Burden. I can bring something out of that girl. She's barely seventeen, not too old to learn new ways. She's good-looking, too, she added warmly. Frances turned to Grandmother. Oh, yes, Mrs. Burden, you didn't tell us that. She was working in the garden when we got there, barefoot and ragged, but she has such fine brown legs and arms and splendid color in her cheeks, like those big dark red plums. We were pleased at this praise. Grandmother spoke feelingly. When she first came to this country, Frances, and had that genteel old man to watch over her, she was as pretty a girl as I ever saw. But dear me, what a life she's led, out in the fields with those rough thrashers. Things would have been very different with poor Antonia if her father had lived. The Harlings begged us to tell them about Mr. Shimerda's death and the big snowstorm. By the time we saw Grandfather coming home from church, we had told them pretty much all we knew of the Shimerdas. The girl will be happy here, and she'll forget those things, said Mrs. Harling confidently, as we rose to take our leave. End of Book Two, Chapter Two Book Two, Chapter Three of My Antonia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katie Gibbony, Arkansas, November 2007. My Antonia by Willa Cather, Book Two, The Hired Girls, Chapter Three. On Saturday, Ambrose drove up to the back gate, and Antonia jumped down from the wagon and ran into our kitchen, just as she used to do. She was wearing shoes and stockings, and was breathless and excited. She gave me a playful shake by the shoulders. "'You ain't forget about me, Jim.' Grandmother kissed her. "'God bless you, child. Now you've come, you must try to do right and be a credit to us.' Antonia looked eagerly about the house and admired everything. "'Maybe I be the kind of girl you like better, now I come to town,' she suggested hopefully. "'How good it was to have Antonia near us again!' to see her every day and almost every night. Her greatest fault, Mrs. Harling found, was that she so often stopped her work and fell to playing with the children. She would race about the orchard with us, 
or take sides in our hay fights in the barn, or be the old bear that came down from the mountain and carried off Nina. Tony learned English so quickly that by the time school began she could speak as well as any of us. I was jealous of Tony's admiration for Charlie Harling, because he was always first in his classes at school, and could mend the water pipes or the doorbell, and take the clock to pieces. She seemed to think him a sort of prince. Nothing that Charlie wanted was too much trouble for her. She loved to put up lunches for him when he went hunting, to mend his ball gloves and sew buttons on his shooting coat, bake the kind of nut cakes he liked, and fed his setter dog when he was away on trips with his father. Antonia had made herself cloth working slippers out of Mr. Harling's old coats, and in these she went padding about after Charlie, fairly panting with eagerness to please him. Next to Charlie, I think she loved Nina best. Nina was only six, and she was rather more complex than the other children. She was fanciful, had all sorts of unspoken preferences, and was easily offended. At the slightest disappointment or displeasure, her velvety brown eyes filled with tears, and she would lift her chin and walk silently away. If we ran after her and tried to appease her, it did no good. She walked on unmollified. I used to think that no eyes in the world could grow so large or hold so many tears as Nina's. Mrs. Harling and Antonia invariably took her part. We were never given a chance to explain. The charge was simply, You have made Nina cry. Now Jimmy can go home, and Sally must get her arithmetic. I like Nina, too. She was so quaint and unexpected, and her eyes were lovely, but I often wanted to shake her. We had jolly evenings at the Harlings when father was away. If he was at home, the children had to go to bed early, or they came over to my house to play. Mr. Harling not only demanded a quiet house, he demanded all his wife's attention. He used to take her away to their room in the West L, and talk over his business with her all evening. Though we did not realize it then, Mrs. Harling was our audience when we played, and we always looked to her for suggestions. Nothing flattered one like her quick laugh. Mr. Harling had a desk in his bedroom and his own easy chair by the window in which no one else ever sat. On the nights when he was at home, I could see his shadow on the blind, and it seemed to me an arrogant shadow. Mrs. Harling paid no heed to anyone else if he was there. Before he went to sleep, she always got him a lunch of smoked salmon or anchovies and beer. He kept an alcohol lamp in his room and a French coffee pot, and his wife made coffee for him at any hour of the night he happened to want it. Most Black Hawk fathers had no personal habits outside their domestic ones. They paid the bills, pushed the baby carriage after office hours, moved the sprinkler about over the lawn, and took the family driving on Sunday. Mr. Harling, therefore, seemed to me autocratic and imperial in his ways. He walked, talked, put on his gloves, shook hands, like a man who felt that he had power. He was not tall, but he carried his head so haughtily that he looked like a commanding figure, and there was something daring and challenging in his eyes. I used to imagine that the nobles, of whom Antonia was always talking, probably looked very much like Christian Harling, wore caped overcoats like his, and just such a glittering diamond upon the little finger. Except when the father was at home, the Harling house was never quiet. Mrs. Harling and Nina and Antonia made as much noise as a house full of children, and there was usually somebody at the piano. Julia was the only one who held down to regular hours of practicing, but they all played. When Frances came home at noon, she played until dinner was ready. When Sally got back from school, she sat down in her hat and coat and drummed the plantation melodies that Negro minstrel troops brought to town. Even Nina played the Swedish wedding march. Mrs. Harling had studied the piano under a good teacher, and somehow she managed to practice every day. I soon learned that if I were sent over on an errand and found Mrs. Harling at the piano, I must sit down and wait quietly until she turned to me. I can see her at this moment, her short, square person planted firmly on the stool, her little fat hands moving quickly and neatly over the keys, her eyes fixed upon the music with intelligent concentration. End of Book Two, Chapter Three Book Two, Chapter Four of My Antonia 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katie Gibney, Arkansas, November 2007. My Antonia by Willa Cather, Book Two, The Hired Girls, Chapter Four. I won't have none of your weevily wheat, and I won't have none of your barley, but I'll take a measure of fine white flour to make a cake for Charlie. We were singing rhymes to tease Antonia while she was beating up one of Charlie's favorite cakes in her big mixing bowl. It was a crisp autumn evening, just cold enough to make one glad to quit playing tag in the yard and retreat into the kitchen. We had begun to roll popcorn balls with syrup when we heard a knock at the back door, and Tony dropped her spoon and went to open it. A plump, fair-haired girl was standing in the doorway. She looked demure and pretty, and made a graceful picture in her blue cashmere dress and little blue hat, with a plaid shawl drawn neatly about her shoulders and a clumsy pocket-book in her hand. "'Hello, Tony. Don't you know me?' she asked in a smooth, low voice, looking in at us archly. Antonia gasped and stepped back. "'Why, it's Lena. Of course I didn't know you, so dressed up.' Lena Lingard laughed, as if this pleased her. I had not recognized her for a moment either. I had never seen her before with a hat on her head, or with shoes and stockings on her feet, for that matter. And here she was, brushed and smoothed and dressed like a little town girl, smiling at us with perfect composure." "'Hello, Jim,' she said carelessly as she walked into the kitchen and looked about her. "'I've come to town to work, too, Tony.' "'Have you now? Well, ain't that funny?' Antonia stood ill at ease and didn't seem to know just what to do with her visitor. The door was open into the dining-room where Mrs. Harling sat crocheting and Frances was reading. Frances asked Lena to come in and join them. "'You are Lena Lingard, aren't you? I've been to see your mother, but you were off herding cattle that day.' "'Mama, this is Chris Lingard's oldest girl.' Mrs. Harling dropped her worsted and examined the visitor with quick, keen eyes. Lena was not at all disconcerted. She sat down in the chair Frances pointed out, carefully arranging her pocket-book and gray cotton gloves on her lap. We followed with our popcorn, but Antonia hung back, said she had to get her cake into the oven. "'So you have come to town,' said Mrs. Harling, her eyes still fixed on Lena. "'Where are you working?' "'For Mrs. Thomas, the dressmaker. She is going to teach me to sew. She says I have quite a knack. I'm through with the farm. There ain't any end to the work on a farm, and always so much trouble happens. I'm going to be a dressmaker.' "'Well, there have to be dressmakers. It's a good trade. But I wouldn't run down the farm if I were you,' said Mrs. Harling rather severely. "'How is your mother?' "'Oh, mother's never very well. She has too much to do. She'd get away from the farm, too, if she could.' She was willing for me to come. After I learn to do sewing, I can make money and help her. "'See that you don't forget to,' said Mrs. Harling skeptically, as she took up her crocheting again, and sent the hook in and out with nimble fingers. "'No, am I won't,' said Lena blandly. She took a few grains of the popcorn we pressed upon her, eating them discreetly, and taking care not to get her fingers sticky. Frances drew her chair up nearer to the visitor, "'I thought you were going to be married, Lena,' she said teasingly. "'Didn't I hear that Nick Svenson was rushing you pretty hard?' Lena looked up with her curiously innocent smile. "'He did go with me quite a while, but his father made a fuss about it and said he wouldn't give Nick any land if he married me, so he's going to marry Annie Iverson. I wouldn't like to be her. Nick's awful sullen, and he'll take it out on her. He ain't spoke to his father since he promised.' Frances laughed. "'And how do you feel about it?' "'I don't want to marry Nick or any other man,' Lena murmured. "'I've seen a good deal of married life, and I don't care for it. "'I want to be so I can help my mother and the children at home, "'and not have to ask leave of anybody.' "'That's right,' said Frances. "'And Mrs. Thomas thinks you can learn dressmaking?' "'Yes, am I've always liked to sew, but I never had much to do with. "'Mrs. Thomas makes lovely things for all the town ladies.' Did you know Mrs. Gardner is having a purple velvet made? The velvet came from Omaha. My, but it's lovely. Lena sighed softly and stroked her cashmere folds. Tony knows I never did like out-of-door work, she added. Mrs. Harling glanced at her. I expect you'll learn to sew all right, Lena, if you'll only keep your head and not go gadding about to dances all the time and neglect your work, the way some country girls do. 
"'Yes'm. Tiny Soderball is coming to town, too. She's going to work at the Boys' Home Hotel. She'll see lots of strangers,' Lena added wistfully. "'Too many, like enough,' said Mrs. Harling. "'I don't think a hotel is a good place for a girl, though I guess Mrs. Gardner keeps an eye on her waitresses.' Lena's candid eyes, that always looked a little sleepy under their long lashes, kept straying about the cheerful rooms with naive admiration. Presently she drew on her cotton gloves. "'I guess I must be leaving,' she said irresolutely. Frances told her to come again whenever she was lonesome or wanted advice about anything. Lena replied that she didn't believe she would ever get lonesome in Black Hawk. She lingered at the kitchen door and begged Antonia to come and see her often. I've got a room of my own at Mrs. Thomas's, with a carpet. Tony shuffled uneasily in her cloth slippers. I'll come some time, but Mrs. Harling don't like to have me run much, she said evasively. You can do what you please when you go out, can't you? Lena asked in a guarded whisper. Ain't you crazy about town, Tony? I don't care what anybody says. I'm done with the farm. She glanced back over her shoulder toward the dining room, where Mrs. Harling sat. When Lena was gone, Frances asked Antonia why she hadn't been a little more cordial to her. "'I didn't know if your mother would like her coming here,' said Antonia, looking troubled. She was kind of talked about, out there. "'Yes, I know. But mother won't hold it against her if she behaves well here. You needn't say anything about that to the children. I guess Jim has heard all that gossip.' When I nodded, she pulled my hair and told me I knew too much anyhow. We were good friends, Frances and I. I ran home to tell Grandmother that Lena Lingard had come to town. We were glad of it, for she had a hard life on the farm. Lena lived in the Norwegian settlement west of Squaw Creek, and she used to herd her father's cattle in the open country between his place and the Shimerdas. Whenever we rode over in that direction, we saw her out among her cattle, bareheaded and barefooted, scantily dressed in tattered clothing, always knitting as she watched her herd. Before I knew Lena, I thought of her as something wild, that always lived on the prairie, because I had never seen her under a roof. Her yellow hair was burned to a ruddy thatch on her head, but her legs and arms, curiously enough, in spite of constant exposure to the sun, kept a miraculous whiteness which somehow made her seem more undressed than the other girls who went scantily clad. The first time I stopped to talk to her I was astonished at her soft voice and easy, gentle ways." The girls out there usually got rough and mannish after they went to herding. But Lena asked Jake and me to get off our horses and stay a while, and behaved exactly as if she were in a house and were accustomed to having visitors. She was not embarrassed by her ragged clothes, and treated us as if we were old acquaintances. Even then I noticed the unusual color of her eyes, a shade of deep violet, and their soft, confiding expression. Chris Lingard was not a very successful farmer, and he had a large family. Lena was always knitting stockings for little brothers and sisters, and even the Norwegian women, who disapproved of her, admitted that she was a good daughter to her mother. As Tony said, she had been talked about. She was accused of making old Benson lose the little sense he had, and that at an age when she should still have been in pinafores. Ole lived in a leaky dugout somewhere at the edge of the settlement. He was fat and lazy and discouraged, and bad luck had become a habit with him. After he had had every other kind of misfortune, his wife, Crazy Mary, tried to set a neighbor's barn on fire and was sent to the asylum at Lincoln. She was kept there for a few months, then escaped and walked all the way home, nearly two hundred miles, traveling by night and hiding in barns and haystacks by day. When she got back to the Norwegian settlement, her poor feet were as hard as hoofs. She promised to be good and was allowed to stay at home, though everyone realized she was as crazy as ever. And she still ran about barefooted through the snow, telling her domestic troubles to her neighbors. Not long after Mary came back from the asylum, I heard a young Dane, who was helping us to thrash, tell Jake and Otto that Chris Lingard's oldest girl had put old Benson out of his head, until he had no more sense than his crazy wife. When Ole was cultivating his corn that summer, he used to get discouraged in the fields, tie up his team, and wander off to wherever Lena Lingard was herding. There he would sit down on the draw side and help her watch her cattle. All the settlement was talking about it. The Norwegian preacher's wife went to Lena and told her that she ought not to allow this. She begged Lena to come to church on Sundays, 
Lena said she hadn't a dress in the world any less ragged than the one on her back. Then the minister's wife went through her old trunks and found some things she had worn before her marriage. The next Sunday Lena appeared at church, a little late, with her hair done up neatly on her head like a young woman, wearing shoes and stockings, and the new dress which she had made over for herself very becomingly. The congregation stared at her, until that morning no one, unless it were old, had realized how pretty she was, or that she was growing up. The swelling lines of her figure had been hidden under the shapeless rags she wore in the fields. After the last hymn had been sung, and the congregation was dismissed, Ole slipped out to the hitch bar and lifted Lena on her horse. That in itself was shocking. A married man was not expected to do such things. But it was nothing to the scene that followed. Crazy Mary darted out from the group of women at the church door and ran down the road after Lena, shouting horrible threats. "'Look out, you Lena Lingard, look out! I'll come over with a corn knife one day and trim some of that shape off you. Then you won't sail round so fine, making eyes at men.' The Norwegian women didn't know where to look. They were formal housewives, most of them, with a severe sense of decorum. But Lena Lingard only laughed her lazy, good-natured laugh and rode on, gazing back over her shoulder at Ole's infuriated wife. The time came, however, when Lena didn't laugh. More than once Crazy Mary chased her across the prairie and round and round the Shimerda's cornfield. Lena never told her father, perhaps she was ashamed, perhaps she was more afraid of his anger than of the corn knife. I was at the Shimerda's one afternoon when Lena came bounding through the red grass fast as her white legs could carry her. She ran straight into the house and hid in Antonia's feather bed. Mary was not far behind. She came right up to the door and made us feel how sharp her blade was, showing us very graphically just what she meant to do to Lena. Mrs. Shimerda, leaning out of the window, enjoyed the situation keenly, and was sorry when Antonia sent Mary away, mollified by an apron full of bottle tomatoes. Lena came out from Tony's room behind the kitchen, very pink from the heat of the feathers, but otherwise calm. She begged Antonia and me to go with her and help get her cattle together. They were scattered and might be gorging themselves in somebody's cornfield. "'Maybe you lose a steer and learn not to make some things happen with your eyes at married men,' Mrs. Shimerda told her hectoringly. Lena only smiled her sleepy smile. "'I never made anything to him with my eyes. I can't help it if he hangs around, and I can't order him off. It ain't my prairie.'" End of Book Two, Chapter Four Book Two, Chapter Five of My Antonia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katie Gibney, Arkansas, November 2007. My Antonia by Willa Cather. Book Two, The Hired Girls, Chapter Five. After Lena came to Black Hawk, I often met her downtown, where she would be matching sewing silk or buying findings for Mrs. Thomas. If I happened to walk home with her, she told me all about the dresses she was helping to make, or about what she saw and heard when she was with Tiny Soderball at the hotel on Saturday nights. The boys' home was the best hotel on our branch of the Burlington, and all the commercial travelers in that territory tried to get into Black Hawk for Sunday. They used to assemble in the parlor after supper on Saturday nights. Marshall Field's man, Anson Kirkpatrick, played the piano and sang all the latest sentimental songs. After Tiny had helped the cook wash the dishes, she and Lena sat on the other side of the double doors between the parlor and the dining room, listening to the music and giggling at the jokes and stories. Lena often said she hoped I would be a traveling man when I grew up. They had a gay life of it. Nothing to do but ride about on trains all day and go to theaters when they were in big cities. Behind the hotel there was an old store building where the salesmen opened their big trunks and spread out their samples on the counters. The Black Hawk merchants went to look at these things and order goods, and Mrs. Thomas, though she was retail trade, was permitted to see them and to get ideas. They were all generous, these traveling men. They gave tiny solder-ball handkerchiefs and gloves and ribbons and striped stockings and so many bottles of perfume and cakes of scented soap that she bestowed some of them on Lena. 
One afternoon, in the week before Christmas, I came upon Lena and her funny, square-headed little brother Chris, standing before the drug store, gazing in at the wax dolls and blocks and Noah's arcs arranged in the frosty show window. The boy had come to town with a neighbor to do his Christmas shopping, for he had money of his own this year. He was only twelve, but that winter he had got the job of sweeping out the Norwegian church and making the fire in it every Sunday morning. A cold job it must have been, too. We went into Duckford's dry goods store, and Chris unwrapped all his presents and showed them to me, something for each of the six younger than himself, even a rubber pig for the baby. Lena had given him one of Tiny Soderball's bottles of perfume for his mother, and he thought he would get some handkerchiefs to go with it. They were cheap, and he hadn't much money left. We found a table full of handkerchiefs spread out for view at Duckford's. Chris wanted those with initial letters in the corner, because he had never seen any before. He studied them seriously while Lena looked over his shoulder, telling him she thought the red letters would hold their color best. He seemed so perplexed that I thought perhaps he hadn't enough money after all. Presently he said gravely, "'Sister, you know Mother's name is Bertha. I don't know if I ought to get B for Bertha or M for Mother.' Lena patted his bristly head. "'I'd get the B, Chrissy. It will please her for you to think about her name. Nobody ever calls her by it now.' That satisfied him. His face cleared at once, and he took three reds and three blues. When the neighbor came in to say that it was time to start, Lena wound Chris's comforter about his neck and turned up his jacket collar. He had no overcoat. And we watched him climb into the wagon and start on his long, cold drive. As we walked together up the windy street, Lena wiped her eyes with the back of her woolen glove. "'I get awful homesick for them, all the same,' she murmured as if she were answering some remembered reproach. End of Book Two, Chapter Five In Chapter Six of My Antonia, this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Crystal Layton. My Antonia by Willa Cather. Book One, Hired Girls, Chapter Six. Winter comes down savagely over a little town on the prairie. The wind that sweeps in from the open country slips away all the leafy screens that hide one yard from another in summer, and the houses seem to draw closer together. The roofs that look so far away across the green treetops now stare at you in the face, and they are so much uglier than when their angles were softened by vines and shrubs. In the morning, when I was fighting my way to school against the wind, I couldn't see anything but the road in front of me, but in the late afternoon when I was coming home, the town looked bleak and desolate to me. The pale, cold light of the winter sunset did not beautify. It was like the light of truth itself. When the smoky clouds hung low in the west and the red sun went down behind them, leaving a pink flush on the snowy roofs and the blue drifts, then the wind sprang up afresh with a kind of bitter song, as if it said, This is reality whether you like it or not. All those frivolities of summer, the light and shadow, the living mask of green that trembled over everything, they were lies, and this is what was underneath. This is the truth. It was as if we were being punished for loving the loveliness of summer. If I loitered on the playground after school, or went to the post office for the mail and lingered to hear the gossip about the cigar stand, it would be growing dark by the time I came home. The sun was gone, the frozen street stretched long and blue before me, the lights were shining pale in kitchen windows, and I could smell the suppers cooking as I passed. Few people were abroad, and each one of them was hurrying toward a fire. The glowing stoves in the houses were like magnets. When one passed, an old man, one could see nothing of his face but a red nose sticking out between a frosted beard and a long plush cap. The young men capered along with their hands in their pockets, and sometimes tried to slide on the icy sidewalk. The children in the bright hoods and comforters never walked but always ran from the moment they left their door, beating their mittens against their sides. When I got as far as the Methodist church, I was about halfway home. I can remember how glad I was when there happened to be a light in the church, and the painted glass windows shone out at us as we came along the frozen street. In the winter bleakness a hunger for color came over people, like the Laplanders craving for fats and sugar. Without knowing why, we used to linger on the sidewalk outside the church when the lamps were lighted early for a choir practice or prayer meeting shivering and talking until our feet were like lumps of ice. 
The crude reds and greens and blues of that colored glass held us there. On winter nights, the lights in the Harling's window drew me like the painted glass. Inside that warm, roomy house, there was color, too. After supper, I used to catch up my cap, stick my hands in my pockets, and dive through the willow hedge as if witches were after me. Of course, if Mr. Harling was at home, if his shadow stood out in the blind of the west room, I did not go in, but turned and walked home by the long way, through the street, wondering what book I should read as I sat down with the two old people. Such disappointments only gave greater zest to the nights when we acted charades, or had a costume ball in the back parlor, when Sally always dressed like a boy. Frances taught us to dance that winter, and she said from the first lesson that Auntie would make the best dancer among us. On Saturday nights, Mrs. Harling used to play the old operas for us, Martha, Norma, Rigoletto, telling us a story while she played. Every Saturday night was like a party. The parlor, the back parlor, and the dining room were warm and brightly lighted, with comfortable chairs and sofas and gay pictures on the walls. One always felt at ease there. Antonia brought her sewing and sat with us. She was already beginning to make pretty clothes for herself. After the long winter evenings on the prairie, when Ambrosia's sudden silences and her mother's complaints, the Harlings' house seemed, as she said, like heaven to her. She was never too tired to make taffy or chocolate cookies for us. If Sally whispered in her ear, or Charlie gave her three winks, Tony would rush into the kitchen and build a fire on the range in which she had already cooked three meals that day. While we sat in the kitchen waiting for the cookies to bake or the taffy to cool, Nina used to coax Antonia to tell her stories, about the calf that broke its leg, or how Yulka saved her little turkeys from drowning in the freshet, or about old Christmases and weddings in Bohemia. Nina interrupted the stories about the crush fancifully, and in spite of our derision, she cherished a belief that Christ was born in Bohemia a short time before the Shimerdas left that country. We all liked Tony's stories. Her voice had a peculiarly engaging quality. It was deep, a little husky, and one always heard the breath vibrating behind it. Everything she said seemed to come right out of her heart. One evening, when we were picking out kernels for walnut taffy, Tony told us a new story. Mrs. Harling, did you ever hear about what happened up in the Norwegian settlement last summer when I was thrashing there? We were at Iverson's, and I was driving one of the grain wagons. Mrs. Harling came out and sat down among us. Could you throw the wheat into the bin yourself, Tony? She knew what heavy work it was. Yes, ma'am, I did. I could shovel just as fast that fat Andern boy that drove the other wagon. One day it was just awful hot. When we got back to the field from dinner, we took things kind of easy. The men put in the horses and got the machine going, and old Iverson was up on the deck cutting bands. I was sitting against a straw stack trying to get some shade. My wagon wasn't going out first, and somehow I felt the heat awful that day. The sun was so hot like I was going to burn the whole world up. After a while, I see a man come across the stubble, and when he got close, I see it was a tramp. His toes stuck out of his shoes, and he hadn't shaved for a long while, and his eyes were awful red and wild, like he had some sickness. He comes right up and begins to talk like he knows me already. He says, The ponds in this country's done got so low a man couldn't drown himself in one of them. I told him nobody wanted to drown themselves, but if we didn't have rain soon, we'd have to pump water for the cattle. Oh, cattle, he says. Y'all take care of your cattle. Ain't you got no beer here? I told me now to go to the Bohemian for beer. The Norwegians didn't have none when they thrashed. My God, he says. So it's Norwegians now, is it? I thought this was Ameriky. Then he goes up to the machine and yells out to old Iverson. Hello, partner, let me up there. I can cut bands and I'm tired of tramping. I won't go no farther. I try to make signs to old because I thought that man was crazy and might get the machine stopped up. But old... He was glad to get down out of the sun and chafe. It gets down your neck and sticks to you something awful when it's hot like that. So Ol jumped down and crawled under one of the wagons for shade, and the tramp got on the machine. He cut bands all right for a few minutes, and then Mrs. Harling, he waved his hand at me and jumped head first right into the thrash machine after that wheat. I begun to scream and the men run to stop the horses, but the belt had sucked him down, and by the time they got her stopped he was all beat and cut to pieces. He was wedged in so tight it was a hard job to get him out, and the machine ain't never worked right since. Was he clear dead, Tony? we cried. Was he dead? Well, I guess so. There now, Nina's all upset. We won't talk about it. Don't you cry, Nina. No old tramp will get you while Tony's here. Mrs. Harling spoke up sternly. 
Stop crying, Nina, or I'll always send you upstairs when Antonia tells us about the country. Did they never find out where he came from, Antonia? Never, ma'am. He hadn't been seen nowhere except the little town they call Conway. He tried to get beer there, but there wasn't any saloon. Maybe he came on a freight, but the brakeman hadn't seen him. They couldn't find no letters nor nothing on him. Nothing but an old penknife in his pocket, and the wishbone of a chicken wrapped up in a piece of paper, and some poetry. Some poetry? we exclaimed. I remember, said Francis. It was the old oaken bucket cut out of a newspaper and nearly worn out. Old Iverson brought it into the office and showed it to me. Now, wasn't that strange, Mrs. Francis? Tony asked thoughtfully. What would anybody want to kill themselves in summer for? And thrashing time, too. It's nice everywhere, then. So it is, Antonia, said Mrs. Harling heartily. Maybe I'll go home and help you thrash next summer. Isn't that taffy nearly ready to eat? I've been smelling it a long while. There's a basic harmony between Antonia and her mistress. They had strong, independent natures, both of them. They knew what they liked and were not always trying to imitate other people. They loved children and animals and music, and rough play and digging in the earth. They liked to prepare rich, hearty food, and to see people eat it, to make us soft, white beds and to see youngsters asleep in them. They ridiculed conceited people, and were quick to help unfortunate ones. Deep down in each of them there's a kind of hearty duality, a relish of life. Not over-delicate, but very invigorating. I never tried to define it, but I was distinctly conscious of it. I could not imagine Antonia living for a week in any other house in Blackhawk than the Harlingses. End of chapter 6 Recording by Crystal Layton Chapter 7 of My Antonia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nikki Sullivan. My Antonia by Willa Cather. Book Two. The Hired Girls. Chapter Seven. Winter lies too long in country towns. Hangs on until it is stale and shabby, old and sullen. On the farm the weather was the great fact, and the men's affairs went on underneath it, as the steams creep under the ice. But in Black Hawk the scene of human life was spread out, shrunken and pitched, frozen down to the bare stalk. Through January and February I went to the river with the Harlings on clear nights, and we skated up to the big island and made bonfires on the frozen sand. But by March the ice was rough and choppy, and the snow on the river bluffs was gray and mournful looking. I was tired of school, tired of winter clothes, of rutted streets, of the dirty drifts and piles of cinders that had lain in the yard so long. There was only one break in the dreary monotony of that month, when Blind d'Arnaud, the negro pianist, came to town. He gave a concert at the opera house on Monday night, and he and his manager spent Saturday and Sunday at our comfortable hotel. Mrs. Harling had known Dierno for years. She told Antonia that she had better go see Tiny that Saturday evening, as there would certainly be music at the boys' home. Saturday night, after supper, I ran downtown to the motel and slipped quietly into the parlor. The chairs and sofas were already occupied, and the air smelled pleasantly of cigar smoke. The parlor had once been two rooms, and the floor was sway-backed where the partition had been cut away. The wind from without made waves in the long carpet. A coal stove glowed at either end of the room, and the grand piano in the middle stood open. There was an atmosphere of unusual freedom about the house that night, for Mrs. Gardiner had gone to Omaha for a week. Johnny had been having drinks with the guests until he was rather absent-minded. It was Mrs. Gardiner who ran the business and looked after everything. Her husband stood at the desk and welcomed incoming travelers. He was a popular fellow, but no manager. Mrs. Gardiner was admittedly the best-dressed woman in Black Hawk, drove the best horse, and had a smart trap and a little white and gold sleigh. She seemed indifferent to her possessions, was not half so solicitous about them as her friends were. She was tall, dark, severe, with something Indian-like in the rigid immobility of her face. Her manner was cold, and she talked little. Guests felt that they were receiving, not conferring, a favor when they stayed at her house. 
Even the smartest travelling men were flattered when Mrs. Gardiner stopped to chat with them for a moment. The patrons of the hotel were divided into two classes, those who had seen Mrs. Gardiner's diamonds, and those who had not. When I stole into the parlour, Anson Kirkpatrick, Marshall Field's man, was at the piano, playing airs from a musical comedy then running in Chicago. He was a dapper little Irish man, very vain, homely as a monkey, with friends everywhere, and a sweetheart in every port, like a sailor. I did not know all the men who were sitting about, but I recognized a furniture salesman from Kansas City, a drug man, and Willie O'Reilly, who traveled for a jewelry house and sold musical instruments. The talk was all about good and bad hotels, actors and actresses, and musical protégés. I learned that Mrs. Garner had gone to Omaha to hear Booth and Barrett, who were to play there next week, and that Mary Anderson was having a great success in A Winter's Tale in London. The door from the office opened, and Johnny Gardner came in, directing Blind Arnaud. He would never consent to be led. He was a heavy, bulky mulatto, on short legs, and came tapping the floor in front of him with his gold-headed cane. His yellow face was lifted in the light, with a show of white teeth, all grinning, and his shrunken, papery eyelids lay motionless over his blind eyes. "'Good evening, gentlemen. No ladies here? Good evening, gentlemen.' we going to have a little music? Some of you gentlemen going to play for me this evening? It was the soft, amiable negro voice, like those I remembered from early childhood, with the note of docile subservience in it. He had the negro head, too, almost no head at all, nothing behind the ears but folds of neck under close-clipped wool. He would have been repulsive if his face had not been so kindly and happy. It was the happiest face I had seen since I left Virginia. He felt his way directly to the piano. The moment he sat down, I noticed the nervous infirmity of which Mrs. Harling had told me. When he was sitting, or standing still, he swayed back and forth incessantly, like a rocking toy. At the piano, he swayed in time to the music, and when he was not playing, his body kept up this motion, like an empty mill grinding on. He found the pedals and tried them, ran his yellow hands up and down the keys a few times, tinkling off scales, then turned to the company. She seems all right, gentlemen. Nothing happened to her since the last time I was here. Mrs. Gardner, she always has the piano tuned up for me before I come. Now, gentlemen, I expect you've all got grand voices. Seems like we might have some good old plantation songs tonight. The men gathered round him as he began to play my old Kentucky home. They sang one negro melody after another, while the mulatto sat rocking himself, his head thrown back, his yellow face lifted, its shriveled eyelids, never fluttering. He was born in the far south, on the Darno plantation, where the spirit, if not the fact, of slavery persisted. When he was three weeks old, he had an illness which left him totally blind and as soon as he was old enough to sit up alone and toddle about, another affliction, the nervous motion of his body, became apparent. His mother, a buxom young negro wench who was a laundress for the Darnos, concluded that her blind baby was not right in his head, and she was ashamed of him. She loved him devotedly, but he was so ugly, with his sunken eyes and his fidgets, that she hid him away from people. All the dainties she brought down from the big house were for the blind child, and she beat and cuffed her other children whenever she found them teasing him, or trying to get his chicken bone away from him. He began to talk early, remembering everything he heard, and his mammy said he wasn't all wrong. She named him Samson, because he was blind, but on the plantation he was known as Yellow Martha's simple child. He was docile and obedient, but when he was six years old he began to run away from home, always taking the same direction. He felt his way through the lilacs, along the boxwood hedge, up to the south wing of the big house, where Mrs. Nellie Darno practiced the piano every morning. This angered his mother more than anything else he could have done. She was so ashamed of his ugliness that she couldn't bear to have white folks look at him. Whenever she caught him slipping away from the cabin, she whipped him unmercifully, and told him what dreadful things old Mr. Darno would do to him if he ever found him near the big house. But the next time Samson had a chance, he ran away again. If Mrs. Darnaud stopped practicing for a moment and went towards the window, 
she saw this hideous little pickaninny dressed in an old piece of sacking standing in the open space between the hollyhock rows his body rocking automatically his blind face lifted to the sun and wearing an expression of idiotic rapture often she was tempted to tell martha that the child must be kept at home but somehow the memory of his foolish happy face deterred her she remembered that his sense of hearing was all he had though it did not occur to her that he might have more of it than other children one day samson was standing thus while miss nelly was playing her lesson to her music master the windows were open he heard them get up he heard them get up from the piano talk a little while and then leave the room he heard the door close after them he crept up the front windows and stuck his head in there was no one there he could always detect the presence of any one in a room he put one foot over the window-sill and straddled it his mother had told him over and over how his master would give him to the big mastiff if he ever found him meddling samson had got too near the mastiff's kennel once and had felt his terrible breath on his face he thought about that but he pulled in his other foot through the dark he found his way to the thing to its mouth he touched it softly and it answered softly kindly he shivered and stood still then he began to feel it all over ran his fingertips along the slippery sides embraced the carved legs tried to get some conception of its shape and size of the space it occupied in primeval night it was cold and hard and like nothing else in his black universe he went back to its mouth began at one end of the keyboard and felt his way down into the mellow thunder as far as he could go he seemed to know that it must be done with the fingers and not with the fists or the feet he approached this highly artificial instrument through a mere instinct and coupled himself to it as if he knew it was to piece him out and make a whole creature of him after he had tried all of the sounds he began to finger out passages from things miss nelly had been practicing passages that were already his that lay under the bones of his pinched conical little skull definite as animal desires the door opened miss nelly and her music master stood behind it but blind samson who was so sensitive to presences did not know they were there he was feeling out the pattern that lay all ready-made on the big and little keys when he paused for a moment because the sound was wrong and he wanted another miss nelly spoke softly he whirled about in a spasm of terror leaped forward in the dark struck his head on the open window and fell screaming and bleeding to the floor he had what his mother called a fit the doctor came and gave him opium when samson was well again his young mistress led him back to the piano several teachers experimented with him they found he had absolute pitch and a remarkable memory as a very young child he could repeat after a fashion any composition that was played for him no matter how many wrong notes he struck he never lost the intention of the passage he brought the substance of it across by irregular and astonishing means he wore his teachers out he could never learn like other people never acquired any finish he was always a negro prodigy who played barbarously and wonderfully as piano playing it was perhaps abominable but as music it was something real vitalized by a sense of rhythm that was stronger than his other physical senses that not only filled his dark mind but worried his body incessantly to hear him to watch him was to see a negro enjoying himself as only a negro can it was as if all the agreeable sensations possible to creatures of flesh and blood were heaped up on those black and white keys and he were gloating over them and trickling them through his yellow fingers in the middle of a crashing waltz darnaud suddenly began to play softly and turning to one of the men who stood behind him whispered somebody dancing in there he jerked his bullet head towards the dining room i hear little feet girls i specked anson kirkpatrick mounted the chair and peeped over the transom springing down he wrenched open the doors and ran out into the dining room tiny and lena antonia and mary dusak were waltzing in the middle of the floor they separated and fled towards the kitchen giggling kirkpatrick caught tiny by the elbows what's the matter with you girls dancing out here by yourselves when there's a room full of lonesome men on the other side of the partition introduce me to your friends tiny the girls still laughing were trying to escape tiny looked alarmed mrs gardiner wouldn't like it 
she protested. She'd be awful mad if you was to come out here and dance with us. Mrs. Gardiner's an Omaha girl. Now you're Lena, aren't you? And you're Tony and you're Mary. Have I got you all straight? O'Reilly and the others began to pile the chairs on the tables. Johnny Gardiner ran in from the office. Easy, boys, easy, he entreated them. You'll wake the cook, and there'll be the devil to pay for me. She won't hear the music, but she'll be down the minute anything's moved in the dining room. Oh, what do you care, Johnny? Fire the cook and wire Molly to bring another. Come along. Nobody'll tell tales. Johnny shook his head. Suffect, boys, he said confidently. If I take a drink in Black Hawk, Molly knows it in Alabama. His guests laughed and slapped him on the shoulders. Oh, we'll make it all right with Molly. Get your back up, Johnny. Molly was Mrs. Gardiner's name, of course. Molly Bond was painted in large blue letters in the glossy white side of the hotel bus, and Molly was engraved inside Johnny's ring and on his watch case, doubtless on his heart, too. He was an affectionate little man, and he thought his wife a wonderful woman. He knew that without her he would hardly be more than a clerk in some other man's hotel. At a word from Kirkpatrick, Darnot spread it himself out over the piano and began to draw the dance music out of it. While the perspiration shone on his short wool and on his uplifted face, he looked like some glistening African god of pleasure full of strong, savage blood. Whenever the dancers paused to change partners or to catch breath, he would boom out softly. Who's that going back on me? One of these city gentlemen, I bet. Now you girls, you ain't gonna let that floor get cold. Antonia seemed frightened at first, and kept looking questioningly at Lena and over and Tiny over Willie O'Reilly's shoulder. Tiny Soderball was trim and slender, with lively little feet and pretty ankles. She wore her dress very short. She was quicker in speech, lighter in movement and manner than the other girls. Mary Dusak was broad and brown of countenance, slightly marked by smallpox, but handsome for all that. She had beautiful chestnut hair, coils of it. Her forehead was low and smooth, and her commanding dark eyes regarded the world indifferently and fearlessly. She looked bold and resourceful and unscrupulous, and she was all of these. They were handsome girls, had the fresh color in their country upbringing, and in their eyes that brilliancy which is called, by no metaphor, alas, the light of youth. Darnot played until his manager came and shut the piano. Before he left us, he showed us his gold watch, which struck the hours, and a topaz ring given him by some Russian nobleman who delighted in negro melodies and had heard Darnot play in New Orleans. At last he tapped his way upstairs, after bowing to everybody docile and happy. I walked home with Antonia. We were so excited that we dreaded to go to bed. We lingered a long while at the Harling's gate, whispering in the cold, until the restlessness was slowly chilled out of us. End of chapter 7 Recording by Nikki Sullivan, Chicago Chapter 8 of My Antonia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nikki Sullivan. My Antonia by Willa Cather. Book 2 The Hired Girls. Chapter 8 The Harling children and I were never happier, never felt more contented and secure, than in the weeks of spring which broke that long winter. We were out all day in the thin sunshine, helping Mrs. Harling and Tony break the ground and plant the garden, dig around the orchard trees, tie up the vines, and clip the hedges. Every morning before I was up, I could hear Tony singing in the garden rows. After the apple and cherry trees broke into bloom, we ran around them, hunting for the new nests the birds were building, throwing clods at each other, and playing hide-and-seek with Nina. Yet the summer which was to change everything was coming nearer every day. When boys and girls are growing up, life can't stand still, not even in the quietest of country towns, and they have to grow up, whether they will or no. That is what their elders are always forgetting. It must have been June, for Mrs. Harling and Antonia were preserving cherries, and I stopped one morning to tell them that a dancing pavilion had come to town. I had seen two drays hauling the canvas and painted poles up from the depot. 
That afternoon, three cheerful-looking Italians strolled about Black Hawk, looking at everything, and with them was a dark, stout woman who wore a long gold watch chain around her neck and carried a black lace parasol. They seemed especially interested in children and vacant lots. When I overtook them and stopped to say a word, I found them affable and confiding. They told me they worked in Kansas City in the winter, and in the summer they went among the farming towns with their tent and taught dancing. When business fell off in one place, they moved to another. The dancing pavilion was put up near the Danish laundry, on a vacant lot surrounded by tall, arching cottonwood trees. It was very much like a merry-go-round tent, with open sides and gray flags flying from the poles. Before the week was over, all the ambitious mothers were sending their children to the afternoon dancing class. At three o'clock one met little girls in white dresses and little boys in the round-collared shirts of the time, hurrying along the sidewalk on their way to the tent. Mrs. Vanny received them at the entrance, always dressed in lavender and a great deal of black lace, her important watch-chain lying on her bosom. She wore her hair on the top of her head, built up in a black tower with red coral combs. When she smiled, she showed two rows of strong, crooked yellow teeth. She taught the little children herself, and her husband, the harpist, taught the older ones. Often the mothers brought their fancy work and sat on the shady side of the tent during the lesson. The popcorn man wheeled his glass wagon under the big cottonwood by the door, and lounged in the sun, sure of a good trade when dancing was over. Mr. Jensen, the Danish laundryman, used to bring a chair from his porch and sit out in the grass plot. Some ragged little boys from the depot sold pop and ice lemonade under a white umbrella at the corner, and made faces at the spruce youngsters who came to dance. The vacant lot soon became the most cheerful place in town. Even on the hottest afternoons the cottonwoods made a rustling shade, and the air smelled of popcorn and melted butter and bouncing bets wilting in the sun. Those hardy flowers had run away from the laundryman's garden, and the grass in the middle of the lot was pink with them. The Vanis kept exemplary order, and closed every evening at the hour suggested by the city council. When Mrs. Vanny gave the signal, and the harp struck up Home Sweet Home, all Black Hawk knew it was ten o'clock. You could set your watch by that tune as confidently as by the roundhouse whistle. At last there was something to do in those long, empty summer evenings, when the married people sat like images on the front porches, and the girls and boys tramped and tramped the board sidewalks, northward to the edge of the open prairie, south to the depot, then back again to the post office, the ice cream parlor, the butcher shop. Now there was a place where girls could wear their new dresses, and where one could laugh aloud without being reproved by the ensuing silence. That silence seemed to ooze out of the ground, to hang under the foliage of the black maple trees with the bats and shadows. Now it was broken by the light-hearted sounds. First, the deep purring of Mr. Vanny's harp came in silvery ripples through the blackness of the dusky-smelling night. Then the violins fell in. One of them was almost like a flute. They called so archly, so seductively, that our feet hurried towards the tent of themselves. Why hadn't we had a tent before? Dancing became popular now, just as roller skating had been the summer before. The Progressive Euchre Club arranged with the Vannies for the exclusive use of the floor on Tuesday and Friday nights. At other times, anyone could dance who paid his money and was orderly. The railroad men, the roundhouse mechanics, the delivery boys, the ace man, the farm hands who lived near enough to ride into town after the day's work was over. I never missed a Saturday night dance. The tent was open until midnight then. The country boys came in from the farms eight and ten miles away, and all the country girls were on the floor. Antonia and Lena and Tiny and the Danish laundry girls and their friends. I was not the only boy who found these dances gayer than the others. The young men who belonged to the Progressive Euchre Club used to drop in late and risk a tiff with their sweethearts and general condemnation for a waltz with the hired girls. End of chapter 8. Recording by Nikki Sullivan, Chicago.